in DC for DC. DC Radio, 96.3 HD4 and DCRadio.gov. Thank you, deep voice person with the funky backbeat. Indeed, this is not a council hearing. This is hearing the council. You can't have a government without a council, so you can't have a government radio station without a council show. This is it. We're coming to you from the train track enclosed nerve center that's the headquarters of the Office of Cable TV, Film, Music, and Entertainment. It's also the historic headquarters of Black Entertainment Television, so it's an honor to be here. Dearly beloved, we're gathered here today to celebrate this thing called the Council. I'm Josh Gibson, Director of Communications for the Council. You may also know me as the Council's voice on social media, at Council of DC. If you don't follow us already, get with the program. Here at the Council, our communications goal is to engage with residents in an informative, conversational, and sometimes even enjoyable way. You know if you follow us on Twitter, we're believers in the Mary Poppins School of Communications. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. We want to make it easy for average residents to understand what the Council does. We're demystifying our work and the people who do it. Remember, the DC Council is just like your workplace, except with the dais. On the show, we'll try to keep things light, offbeat, informal, and interesting. You'll learn about policy, learn about people, learn about history, and learn about the institution. Listeners, we've done a number of interviews with council members. They're available on SoundCloud and Apple Podcasts, as well as a bunch of new places, including iHeartRadio. The earlier rounds focused mainly on getting to know the council members, their backgrounds and biographies, successes and struggles. Now, in this round, we're going to focus more on the people at the council, colleagues, co-workers, constituents, and the like. And a quick disclaimer, we shared the general questions in advance so the council members could prep if they chose to. And council members can always pass on a question if they want as well. So now, uh, without any further ado, let me welcome back uh, Ward 5 Council Member Kenya McDuffie. I'm delighted to be back with you, Josh. To facilitate things, we are doing the interview in Ward 5. Which is, makes it easier, and I love that uh, anybody who comes to interview with you has to come to beautiful Ward 5. Exactly. It's a bit <laughs> of a throwdown. It's, you got to come to McDuffie's territory exactly. if you want to be on here in the council. Uh, well, yeah, like I said in the intro, we're uh, focusing on people this time around. And uh, the first question is, uh, talk to us about a role model. And if you have one of each, that'd be great. If there's one in your personal life and if there's one kind of a famous person or historical person. Sure, sure, sure. To. So I, I have more than one role model in my personal life. Um, and I also have one who, who's famous but no longer with us and I've, I've referenced this this person before and in fact I've introduced legislation bearing this person's name uh, but Charles Hammond in Houston uh, has been a role model for me uh, ever since I became interested in the practice of law um, you know after you know graduating from Howard University pursuing uh, law school uh, as a career to be a lawyer uh, I looked to try to identify with 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 you know, people or, or who, who reflected sort of value system and things that I was interested in. I always had an interest since Howard University in, in civil rights and, and, you know, looking at the plight of uh, people of color in the United States in general, but black people in particular. And, and Charles Hammond in Houston, to me, is just somebody who has made such an indelible impact on me, but on the country, whether people know it or not. And what do I mean by that? Um, people have, have generally heard of Thurgood Marshall, right? He's the first Supreme Court Justice of the United States of, of, of African-American uh, race. Charles Hammond in Houston was his mentor. He was the person who was, was at Howard University Law School uh, when Thurgood Marshall was matriculating. He was the person who laid the groundwork uh, for a lot of the civil rights successes in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, you know, Thurgood Marshall and, and others who are part of that, that legal team uh, get credit for Brown v. Board of Education. But Charles Hammond in Houston was the one who helped to come up with those legal theories, uh, in fact, decades before Brown v. Board of Education. And so when I think about uh, a role model, uh, somebody who you know, I, I've I've looked to uh, personally to try to you know replicate things that he did, and and who I've been frankly inspired by, 
uh, is Charles Hammond Houston. Um, personally, you know, it, it's my mom. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, I have more than just one, you know, personal role model. But my mom stands out because, you know, she and my dad really provided uh, a warm and loving household for my siblings and I growing up. Um, you know, and although I lost my dad a few years ago, uh, my mom was always the one who managed to keep the family together. And, and you know, even in good times, I mean, it, she just was the one who you could see was so strong and, and, uh, and solid as a rock who, you know, always put her faith first, you know, her family next, and then service to others. And those are the types of things that, you know, while I didn't know it necessarily growing up as a young kid, um, that I, I'm certain impacted me, uh, particularly on my formative years. And so I still carry with me that sense of faith, family, and service, uh, which my mom really provided the example and continues to provide the example for. Uh, even today, uh, but I also you know have a, a couple others, and I won't go into a whole lot of details. But people like Paul Quander, who um, sadly we lost too early uh, a few years ago, uh, was a was a close personal family friend who uh, I met as a young kid growing up in Stronghold uh, because uh, he worked closely with my godmother, and you know when I discovered that there were ways for me to impact my community. Um, and, and ways for me to to you know, really serve as a lawyer. Uh, I look for examples of people who were successful, who who you know were, were sort of like me, right? I didn't want to look to you know simply the folks who I had to read about. I wanted to look at folks who uh, I could see and, and meet and talk to. And, and Paul Quander was one of those folks who always opened his doors, who who, who always answered my call, uh, who always imparted. Uh, you know, sage uh, advice and counsel, and even hired me uh, after I lost my first election for counsel and, and needed a job. Uh, Paul Quander uh, called me up and, and invited me to come in and, and help to advise uh, him as a deputy mayor for public safety and justice, as well as at the time he was um, acting as chief of staff to, to then Mayor Vince Gray. Uh, and then lastly, really quickly, uh, it, it is a person who, who's not much older than I am. Um, but who's been, you know, such a dear friend and and a mentor and and frankly a role model who who's helped to inspire my career and 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 helped me to make the tough decision to to leave the postal service to go back to college uh, is Roger Fairfax. Uh, he, he's a lawyer uh, and somebody I've known uh, for decades. Uh, our families have been close uh, since. You know, before we were even uh, thought about uh, his mom and my dad uh, grew up together in the same neighborhood in Stronghold. Uh, and, you know, when we were growing up in the 1980s and 1990s and, and we were experiencing much like a lot of other communities across District of Columbia, the, the just horrible violence and, and just everything associated with gun violence in the District of Columbia, being the murder capital of the United States. Uh, Roger managed to, to stay you know, amazingly focused uh, on uh, his studies, on school. Uh, not that he, he you know, didn't you know, obviously you know, uh, have challenges that, that faced everybody else in the community, but he, he you know, set about uh, uh, certain goals, uh, and he accomplished them. He left uh, our neighborhood a stronghold and, and graduated from Archbishop Carroll, where uh, he was a senior, and I was a freshman, and went off to Har Harvard University. Uh, he got a master's at the University of London and went off to Harvard Law School. Uh, I'd never seen anybody in my neighborhood doing anything remotely close to that uh, that I was aware of. And so uh, it was uh, you know, quite the image uh, of seeing that sort of success uh, in a neighborhood of mine where you know, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was blue-collar, working class, and, and you know, a lot of great people uh, in the community growing up and, and, and some of whom are still around uh, but that example of actually leaving the neighborhood going to college and and becoming a, a lawyer um, it just it just it, he, he's been right there in my corner and, and, and was always available and in fact 
even when I didn't solicit his advice, he was there to offer it and provide guidance and counsel. So those are some of the folks who who I look at as role models who who have personally inspired me. Uh, and in the case of of my mom and and, and Roger, uh, still today. Uh, I'm inspired by them and, and still count their advice and counsel uh, whenever I have to make really tough decisions. And I think um, speaking of role models, one thing I've learned from talking to you all is that most of you are more in the category, are less in the category of Mr. Fairfax, who kind of like left the left the neighborhood, took off like a rocket mm-hmm. and the rest is history. Yeah. A lot of you guys struggled. And mm-hmm. I think there's a more powerful role model example to our youth in that Mm -hmm. because you know all the storybooks are just well they did great and everything went wonderfully and i would much rather have them look to someone like you who had kind of ups and downs and who worked you know walked a postal route and that kind of stuff yeah you know that that i think is more meaningful yeah no absolutely and and let me be clear i don't mean to suggest that roger had it had it easy because he had just as many ups and downs uh you know as i had and and i was there to experience some of those ups and downs with him. Um, um, but I will tell you, no, I certainly experienced my own fair share of ups and downs uh, growing up in the neighborhood, you know, uh, experiencing what I would hope no young person would have to experience some of the violence and, and seeing it firsthand and and, and, and actually, um, you know, physically being present uh, and carrying that trauma with, with me still today. You know, I think I've been able to channel it and, 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 and harness it and use it uh, in the work that I do today. Um, but I know that some people have not, you know, who experienced similarly the things that I did, um, uh, weren't able to really turn it around and see the brighter side of their, their, their experiences at the age that we were growing up in. I mean, I, I told a crowd at the uh, African American Real Estate Professionals Gala, they, they gave me an award last week, and, and the, the, the person who introduced me said, uh, I wonder if uh, the Kenya McDuffie of 20 years ago uh, ever uh, envisioned the Kenya McDuffie of today. And, and I had to explain to them that I, I simply didn't. Uh, you know, tw- 25, you know, 30 years ago, growing up in the neighborhood, I aspired to, to be like the images of success that I saw in my neighborhood, and it was government workers, right? My mom, you know, worked at the Library of Congress. My dad was an electrician for D.C. government, DPW. Uh, and and I wanted to be like them. I wanted to be like Mr. Butler, who who carried mail uh, for years and walked to work every single morning. Uh, I see him walking down North Capitol Street faithfully, uh, dutifully, and and I wanted to be like them. Um, so it wasn't until you know Roger uh, said you know you know along with with him and my, my mom and dad always encouraged me to go to college. But I, you know I think I've shared this with you before, Josh. By the time I got to 12th grade at Woodrow Wilson High School, both my brothers who, who you know, have helped to shape who I am today, who I, I really count as uh, uh, equally as inspirational as, as my, my sister and my mom and dad, but, but they had both dropped out of college. Um, and so looking at them and, and seeing that they weren't successful in college, I, I didn't even bother, didn't apply to a single college because... Uh, I just didn't see it as a viable path. And so to, to, to have Roger, to eventually have met my wife, uh, who uh, similarly was encouraging of, of me, you know, going to college, um, you know, that, that those experiences, those trials and tribulations, um, I carry with them with me today. And, and I, I view the work that I do at the council through the prism of my youth and my upbringing uh, in that small, close-knit community of Stronghold. Yeah, I forget it's, and I, I promise it'll make sense where I'm going in a second. I forget which martial art it is. I think it's jujitsu where you use the power of the attack against you to defend yourself. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that is the skill that's kind of the essence of what uh, some of our council members who grew up struggling and grew up with the tougher side of D.C. during hard times, that's the skill set yeah. is you knew, you know you were attacked. You know things were done in your community that are unspeakable, were done to you that were unspeakable, sometimes by members of the government. Mm-hmm. And your ability to take that attack and turn it and use it back uh, as, as a defense and as your own strength, to take someone else's strength and turn it into your own is, is a talent. No, I appreciate that. I, sincerely, I appreciate that because 
you know, I think some people look at me and, and perhaps look at, you know, Treyon or look at Robert White uh, and, and think of us as the exception uh, to, the, to the rule. And, and I don't want to speak for them, but, but there, there are young men and women in my neighborhood who grew up with me who are far more talented. Um, you know, in, in, in so many ways uh, than, than I was, who, who just didn't simply get the opportunity, who, who you, know, uh, you know, but for an arrest, uh, you know, but for, you know, the use of drugs and addiction, but for, you know, you know, having lost a parent either to violence or to, you know, Vietnam, um, you know, just didn't get the same opportunities that I got. And so I, I, I continue to count my blessings uh, and understand that that I did not get here on my own uh, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. I had people who constantly reached back to to give me a hand up, uh, who thought you know more of me than I thought of myself uh, during those times, and and you know wrapped their arms around me you know so tightly that I had no choice but to think about you know things outside of. Uh, what I was experiencing around me, which was again violence, you know, addiction, early child birth, early death, um, and and you know, despite all those things, I still had you know, family. I had you know my my immediate family, but I had an extended family, aunts and uncles who loved on us. You know, I had I had people in my neighborhood, you know, other people's parents who who you know, uh, would always offer a compliment or weren't afraid to, to, to send uh, a stare my way when, they, when I was doing something that they knew I shouldn't be doing or to call my, my mom or dad to tell them uh, that I was, I was veering in the wrong direction. Uh, and so that, that sense of community, again, even, you know, perhaps when I wasn't aware I was being influenced by it, I was certainly being influenced by it uh, because I look around today and, and, and you know while I love my house and I love you know my neighborhood uh, which is the same neighborhood that that my, that my dad grew up in it's different now um, you know you don't have you know miss Mason and mr. Mason you know three doors up who you know had kids who grew up in the neighborhood you don't have you know miss Spencer or miss Abney uh, those folks have, have passed away, and, and, the, and in some cases, the houses have been sold, uh, and and it's just a different neighborhood. So adjusting to that, uh, you know, my dad grew up. He would tell stories about uh, the hundreds of kids in the neighborhood who played together, who played sports, and in fact, the neighborhood is called Stronghold because of sports teams, right? And then you had um, my neighborhood when I was growing up as a kid, and there were fewer kids than, than sort of the baby boomers, but there were. Nonetheless, there were lots of kids, and we played baseball and football and basketball on court in the back of my house on concrete alleys, you know, and 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 we learned so many lessons growing up. But I look around today, and, and my daughters just don't have that same sense of of I think friendship and 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 just the, the number of kids running around the alleys, riding bicycles up and down, and and just you know, sort of, you know, getting into trouble and, and, and just building those bonds uh, within your community. And so those changes, um, I know, are also some of the changes that, have, you know, contribute to the just high levels of, of social and economic anxiety that that I think we're hearing from long-term residents throughout the District of Columbia. And so I, I see my job as, as trying to, you know, work with uh, new residents, but also work with the residents who've been here for a really long time uh, and help to shape the district and mold it into what it is today, uh, doing some of the toughest challenges that we had uh, in the 80s and 90s. That makes sense. Um, so we went super long, thanks to both of us, on the, on <laughs> no, the first couple. That, no, 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 it's, it's me too. It was, it was good, good, uh, good sort of vignette, good like look back at life um, in the district. Um, we're going to do a couple of quicker questions, um, and then we want to leave time for the uh, fun closeout round. Sure. Because this sure. one is people have had fun with. Yeah. Um, so we, we talked definitely about your family, about role models. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about uh, your um, about your colleagues? You sure. know, uh, who who are some colleagues that you see? You mentioned a couple of them mm -hmm. earlier: uh, Robert White, Trayon White. Uh, who are the colleagues you look to that you work particularly well with, or, or maybe there are some who are different from you that yeah. you learn from? Um, 
I, I'd say I work well with uh, my colleague, the war for Brandon Todd. Um, I think our, our close proximity, uh, sharing a border, uh, sharing communities that, that uh, uh, have similar qualities. Uh, we work really well together, not only legislatively down at the council, but also, you know, we run into each other frequently in the community uh, because we have those borders. So at Lamont Rig Civic Association, uh, or, you know, when it comes to uh, Main Street, uh, that we share, uh, I'm, I'm frequently in contact with Brandon and, and covering issues that, that we both confront, uh, you know, given the similar demographics of our wards. Uh, Chairman Mendelson, though, is somebody who I've, I've, I've really developed, uh, uh, I think, a, a pretty close relationship with over the years. Um, you know, being Chair Pro Tem, being one of the longer serving members of this particular council, I've had an opportunity to work with him closely uh, on a number of things, um, you know, whether it's things like short-term rental, uh, which had its ups and downs, and, and I know he had a hearing today on the implementation that I wasn't able to make it to, but but it, I think that's an example of uh, a really tough measure that we had to, to work together on to, to get it to where it was. I introduced it a few years ago, and it, and it was referred to his committee and, uh, because he has oversight of DCRA, and, and over the years we've worked with stakeholders on either side of the issue uh, to really get it to a place where I think uh, residents across the district uh, will be proud, whether they like the the outcome and, and the ultimate uh, sort of policy direction that we headed in. Um, uh, I really appreciate, you know, how we work to get to where we are today. Uh, and then there are colleagues that, that I simply have, have learned things from. Um, you know, David Grasso uh, doesn't always bring the same perspective that I bring to, to the work. Um, but but I find that he's always open to, to sharing his insights in, in how he ended up uh, on particular areas, right? And so, I mean, I think you know, some people look at uh, some of the things that he's done, and, and, and I look at some of the things he's managed to do, and, and we've worked together on things like, you know, some of the legislation around breweries and distilleries and really helping to create and, and foster and nurture that, that industry uh, before it was what it is today. Um, and... and you know, and so I've appreciated that. And he also has that perspective of, of having spent significant time in the District of Columbia um, and working at places like Colonel Brooks Tavern. And so uh, and he lives in War 5, too. Uh, you know, and so and so um, uh, I've always appreciated working with him. Anita Bonds is somebody who I knew before I was elected to the council because of her. Uh, activism and, and, and as also the fact that she resided resided in War 5. And so. Uh, I, I've seen her at work in the community long before I was on the council and also before she was on the council, too. And so uh, those are some of the folks who, who stand out. Um, I have immense respect for uh, the work that um, uh, other colleagues are doing, too. And I could go down the list of each of them and, and, and point out some of the things that I've learned, you know, the experiences that I've seen uh, both with uh, Brianna Doe of Ward 1 uh, going up against an incumbent like uh, Jim Graham, who was an institution uh, in that community um, and who had managed to build relationships across, uh, you know, the demographics, whether it's race and, and economic level. You know, he had support from all quarters and, and, and the sort of coalition and, and, and the campaign that she put together uh, was very impressive. And, and I think her tenure has been uh, equally as impressive. And so I've, I've enjoyed working with her as well. Um, you know, Alyssa Silverman is, is somebody who I don't always see eye to eye on policy uh, issues, but who, to me, um, I appreciate because of how hard she works at her job. Um, and, and, you know, I've seen that and it comes out, I think, in, in the passion that she, she demonstrates uh, on, on, on issues. And, and I know previously I had looked at some of her work when she was at the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. Uh, when I was running for council the first time and the work that she had done around workforce development programs. And I, and I always uh, sort of kid with her about referencing that um, uh, when I was running for office. And, and you know, when she got down there, she, she continues to work at those really tough issues um, around workforce development, uh, making sure that we're funding programs that actually uh, return an investment uh, uh, for our district residents. And so... Uh, again, uh, you know, a number of colleagues, I think, uh, have done amazing work, including Vincent Gray, who I just I, I really admire for his resiliency uh, and his courage, uh, given, you know, everything he's encountered in his career. So so I could, if I had more time, go down there with yeah, everybody. No, but I I'll stop you. right there. Though. Yeah, sadly, we're, we're tighter <laughs> on time. We could do a half hour on each question. 
Um, just real fast, um, are there any uh, advocates or constituents that you kind of want to shout out for uh, being particularly effective or uh, having an impact? Oh, on absolutely. You? Uh, I'm, you know, as we speak, I've been working closely with uh, activists in the Don't Meet DC uh, community. Uh, they've developed a, a really strong movement, uh, which you know, I think everybody, perhaps your listeners, listeners already know what happened with. Uh, with Donald down at the Metro PCS on the corner of, of Florida Avenue and 7th Street. And, and when he was asked to turn the music off, um, the way that the community came together uh, almost instantaneously with the pop-up go-go's at the corner of 14th and U Street at that same intersection of Florida and 7th Street, uh, they, they turned that into a movement uh, which inspired me uh, to introduce a, a bill to make go-go the official music of Washington, D.C. And so I'll, I'll shout out you know, uh, everybody uh, associated with the Don't Mute DC uh, movement, including uh, people like Ron Moden, Natalie Hopkinson, uh, and so many others uh, who have, have really, you know, Cam Poles, uh, who came to me about, you know, trying to figure out how we can more officially recognize Go-Go Music. And so I'll, I'll shout them out for all the work that they've done and, and they continue to do uh, for Go-Go Music, which, which to me transcends the homegrown genre of music and impacts um, the community more broadly because it, 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 I think it sort of epitomizes what I talked about earlier with the, the sort of social and economic anxiety that so many people are feeling. And so uh, they, they should continue to do what they're doing and, 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 and make sure that it is, it is capturing folks and, and empowering them to, to have a voice down at the Wilson Building because when they come together the way that they, they have and they advocate for issues, uh, people listen. Yeah. And that's another good example of the the jujitsu uh, case study where <laughs> absolutely they had a little attack come at them, sure. but man, did they turn that around and find their own power absolutely in that attempt at criticism. Yeah. So that's a order of magnitude uh, change. Um, so now we're going to go to the closeout questions real okay. fast. Now, basically, what we're going to do here is um, I'm going to name some kind of oddball tasks. And I want you to say which of your current colleagues you think would be best suited for them and right. why. But this <laughs> okay. is def total speed round, okay? I, I do it really fast. Okay. So assembling IKEA furniture. I would say Phil Mendelson. Phil Mendelson, you're not the first. Because he's always in the weeds and the minutia. You're you're not the first to say that. Um, how about uh, at a uh, let's see, how about driving cross country? Which colleague would you get in a car and drive cross country? I with? would say Alyssa Silverman, because she's the one who I think I know the least about, who I find interesting and want to know more about. Okay. So having all that time would, would probably give us some time to chat about and share each other's stories. That that makes sense. Um, how about, uh, and, and maybe a number of them already have, but who would you bring home to meet your family? I would like to bring home Robert White. They already kind of know Robert, but I think we have so many similarities um, um, so both having grown up in a district, uh, having two young, you know, daughters and, mm -hmm. and, and, and so I think I, I'd like to sort of bring them home. So, so my girls can meet his girls and kind of, I think it'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, how about, uh, compiling a musical playlist? I think Charles Allen probably has some stuff that, that I might want to hear. Um, Tell me more, because uh, you were the first one to quote Charles Allen as a musical. You know what? Uh, because I just inspiration. He, 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 I know Charles, and, and I know you know sort of uh, him from his time as, as chief of staff for Tommy Wells, and and he sort of has a cool side to him that I don't I don't know that I, I have an opportunity to explore, and so I'm curious as to what he actually has in his playlist, and and so I'm, I'm in terms of music, I, I'm straight hip hop R and B. On the other hand, I'm open to all types of genres, and so. I would imagine that he's not sort of pumping Jay-Z the way that I do or, or, or Go-Go as frequently as I do. So mm -hmm. I'd be open to it. Yeah, you got to get past the Eagle Scout a little yeah. bit. <laughs> I was a Cub Scout. I was okay. a Cub Scout. I, 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 now, uh, okay, and let's do one more because okay. this is my favorite. Fighting off barbarians. I would say Mary Che. Mary Che always wins the barbarians. Yeah, she just seems like she has a knack for, for fighting off all types of stuff. Um, and she's also gotten a tattoo on a bed. And so I, yeah, I think I want her uh, in a foxhole when I go up against some barbarians. 
There you go. All right, another vote for Mary Che and the Barbarians, which this would be a great band name, by the way. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, sorry, we've just flown through our half hour, but uh, thank you again so much for joining us. Thanks for being generous with your time. Absolutely. Truly, truly Always appreciate a pleasure it. to be here with you, Josh. Um, and thank you, listeners, for joining us. Tune in again next time. We are at DC Radio at 96.3 on your HD4 dial, dcradio.gov. I'm Josh Gibson. This is not a council hearing. This is Hearing the Council. Thank you. In D.C., for D.C., D.C. Radio, 96.3 HD4 and dcradio.gov.